Thank you, Bart, for that uh, introduction and your kind invitation to present at this event. The um, topic I've chosen today is about excellence in integrated river basin management. It's a topic that um, has become of interest to me since joining the uh, International River Foundation about a year ago because that foundation does specialise in awarding prizes for excellence. I should say this is a little bit of work in progress and I'll appreciate your thoughts and inputs um, after this uh, presentation uh, later uh, during the event. So what I want to do is start with um, some thinking about success criteria. What constitutes success for integrated river basin management? And then I want to look at a number of examples and test those examples against those criteria in three particular contexts. The first being river restoration, the second being river protection, and the third being sustainable development of rivers, particularly healthy river systems. And I'll finish with a few comments on, on the future of IRPM and some take home messages. So this uh, is my proposed list of success criteria. And I've drawn this from, as Bart was saying, a number of um, large river basin case studies presented to the River Symposium and some other sources, uh, particular IMBO uh, and the work they've done uh, from uh, Jean-Francois's uh, presentation at the Symposium. So to run through these, um, for IRBM to be successful, it should be evidence-based, recognising all forms of knowledge. It should emphasise people processes, and we've heard a lot about this, building trust. Co-learning was an important one that came out, and celebrating success um, of the projects. Inclusivity, so all sectors, all demographics, all disciplines, all water sources. Participation of all stakeholders, not only in the planning, but also in the decision making and in the implementation. Managing at the appropriate scale, um, using integrated inf uh, information and monitoring systems related to true adaptive management. Uh, having a master plan that clearly defines objectives and has multi-year priority investments the mobilisation of political will and financial resources, a clear legal framework to support good water governments, and processes in place for continuous improvement through innovation, review, reporting, and foresighting. Finally, transfer and exchange of knowledge and best practices. Now, I've put these criteria into a kind of scorecard that I will examine a number of case studies and see how they perform. So firstly, concentrating on IRBM as it's used for river restoration, I've used the very famous example of the River Rhine and one from Australia, the Mary Darling Basin. Um, you're all now very well versed in the merits of uh, the River Rhine work, of course the winner of the European River Prize and the International River Prize. Um, so back in the late 1979, it was in a poor state. Then. This is one of those examples, and there's a number of examples where crises have really been the stimulus for forging both uh, political action and releasing finances uh, to solve a problem. What impressed me in particular about the Rhine was the demonstration of the results from their action plan that have been achieved. And here we see a whole range of biotic <laughs> groups responding very positively to those actions. We see uh, enormous improvements in water quality here, lead, ammonium, and total phosphorus. We see salmon returning to most of the regions of the River Rhine. We have this marvelous demonstration of the reconnection of river continuity, such an important factor. We see the renaturalization of riverbanks, and clearly still here on those targets, a long way to go on that one. The reactivation of floodplains, the connecting of floodplains back to rivers, again, such an important part of river restoration. And here combined with the opportunity to use these natural systems for flood mitigation, the 
classic win-win that we're always looking for. So how does the River Rhine perform on this scorecard? Well, you get uh, five points is for um, is top mark sent. Um, you see the Rhine. Um, now, now this is a very subjective <laughs> scoring, I should say. This is uh, Nick Scofield's pers personal scoring, so it, uh, it may not uh, stand up to tighter scrutiny, but uh, uh, five points awarded for managing at the appropriate scale and mobilising political will and, and financial resources. And figures like 85 billion euros spent on, on fixing water quality, um, so enormous amount of, uh, of resources there. I think what's interesting about this profile, if you like, this performance profile, is that it's scored very high on all aspects of those success criteria. And I'm kind of putting forward the proposition that if there's a failure in one of those areas, just one of those areas, that could undermine the whole process. And um, that's a proposition that uh, we'll test a little bit more later on. The only three star is for knowledge exchange and best practice, and that's ramping up very quickly from the Rhine with their multilateral twinning work just commencing. The second one in the restoration area is an environmental flows based example from the Murray Darling Basin in Australia. This basin was a finalist last year in the International River Prize. And this is a story about returning a catch from, from severe overuse and overconsumption of water back to sustainable water levels. So the Murray Darling Basin is one seventh of Australia and the Murray Darling River is 3,600 kilometres long. It had a number of issues and a number of records. So it had the um, honour of being ha having the world's largest algal bloom of 1,000 kilometres in 1992. Um, during the severe drought, which ran for uh, 12 years, that's one of the uh, worst droughts in Australia, the basin almost totally dried out. Um, the dams were empty, the wetlands were dry. The <coughs> mouth of the river closed and we saw a massive loss of uh, riparian vegetation, these wonderful river red gum systems. Now a lot of those problems were driven by excessive growth in water consumption, mostly 70% for irrigation. And that continued until these the algal crisis occurred, after which government said, enough is enough, we're going to put a cap on further diversions. Um, the story has now gone a bit further into a phase of trying to draw back those water titlements, which are owned by irrigators. So take that water back off industry and put it back in the river. Uh, quite a <coughs> challenging prop proposition. So what's has been done to achieve this. So actually 1995 was the cap on water diversions. From around 2000, uh, a water market's been established. Now this is probably one of the most significant innovations that Australia has done in the river basin uh, <coughs> sector. And it, it's very impressive. And to establish a water market, you have to initially separate land and water rights or entitlements. Um, you have to set up a a system that allows temporary and permanent trading. And what the outcomes you get is increasingly an allocation of the water being used for higher value and more productive uses. Now during the drought, because the water market was in place, the GDP from the basin dropped only 3%, even though there was no, virtually no water. So the cost of water went from $3,000 a megalitre to 30000 but there was still demand at that level and high productive use made of it. At the height of the drought in 2007, so this is another crisis example, $10, million, $10 billion sorry, was pumped into the Maridani Basin by the federal government to do two things. One, to improve the efficiency of the irrigation industry, and two, to buy back water from the water market, effectively buying water off of farmers and putting it back 
into the rivers. Um, shortly after that was the creation of the Murray Darling Basin Authority, um, and since then it's been on a path of developing a new plan of sustainable water use in the basin. So it had a technology side, in, in, um, uh, improving um, water distribution and, and allocation. Um, it has a very sophisticated environmental watering plan. Um, so in the market you're purchasing water from different parts of the basin effectively as farmers buy and sell. Um, and then the uh, trick is to try and uh, use that purchased water to best effect for environmental outcomes. And 10 key sites um, have been identified in the basin and water applied at critical times uh, for their health outcomes. So we see some real benefits of bringing water back into a dry landscape. So in terms of a scorecard, again, you know, the profile is quite good. There's uh, three fives in this one, the right scale, the master plan, the basin plan, which is a legislated instrument, and mo uh, mobilization of the political and financial resources, the what's now $13 billion of expenditure. I draw your attention, though, to the two-star one. This is participation of stakeholders in planning, decision-making, and actions. That was relatively poorly done. This plan was developed largely in the absence of serious consultation. And when it was released to the community, it created a huge uh, backlash from the irrigation industry. And there, you may have seen pictures of the plan being burnt in the streets. And even to today, there's, it's left a very uh, nasty and unpleasant feeling in that community, which means for future implementation of this plan, they'll have some hurdles to be, to be uh, dealt with. So this is my argument that if you, if you don't tend to all these criteria, you can seriously undermine success um, by failing in just one. Uh, the next example is one of protection. Uh, the Lake Eyre Basin is a very large basin in the centre of, of Australia. It's the winner of the Australian River Prize uh, for 2014 and it's the first time an award's been given for protection only. So this uh, is a magnificent region with some very unusual and interesting and significant places. Um, the partnership for the Lake Eyre Basin have been working for 20 years to preserve this region and formed a, an agreement in 2000 amongst three states and the federal government to protect the rivers. Now the actual actions in protecting the rivers have been dealing with such activities as mining, coal seam gas, um, and a whole range of other works. Now that's been successfully managed uh, to have almost no impact on the groundwater and the river systems of this area. An enormous amount of effort was put into connecting communities upstream to downstream, bringing traditional owners uh, into the process in a, a very real way, and connecting community science, government and industry. There was a, a very strong site and monitoring program, an assessment program covering all the usual uh, things you want to look at, which developed for the first time a real understanding of how these arid systems work and their boom and bust processes. So on a scorecard, you see a very strong profile across all the criteria. Um, five star for evidence-based, and this always of knowing concept is, it's not just our normal Western science, it's indigenous science in this instance, and pract practitioner knowledge that is all brought together into the evidence base. Um, so no um, serious um, weaknesses in that one, and a very meritorious winner. Um, the third category, and the one that I feel that IRBM is struggling with most, <coughs> is in the development of river basins that are fairly healthy, but they're under a lot of development pressure. I'm using here the example from the symposium of the Mekong. And the Mekong is the second most biodiverse river basin 
in the world after the Amazon. And 55 million of its 70 million inhabitants are in the lower part of the basin and live directly off the river for their day-to-day -day sustenance and income. Now, the kind of uh, development pressures and sustainability pressures the basin's under is the high population growth, uh, poverty is endemic, um, a rapid migration from rural to urban, food demand doubling by 2050, some over-exploitation of fish stocks, climate change beginning to play havoc with a whole range of um, attributes in that system, and most recently, huge hydropower uh, developments. So hydropower in itself is the, currently the most contentious issue. Uh, it is the favoured means of energy generation by the riparian countries. Um, and the, the lower Mekong is still um, pretty much free-flowing, so most of the development has been upstream in, the, in, in China's part of the, of the area in particular. Uh, but now there's tw proposed to be 12 large hydropower dams on the lower Mekong, and according to the Mekong River Commission, these dams will block the migration of fish, change their natural habitats, and put at risk 100 species of extinction. So if you look at the um, larger economic picture of the greater Mekong, which um, houses 270 million people, uh, since the early 90s and with a lot of external funding, largely from the Asian Development Bank, there's been a program of economic development through uh, economic corridors. And those lines are the corridors, the economic corridors that crisscross the region. And this is connecting infrastructure, promoting cross-border trade, and so on, and developing hydropower, navigation, irrigation, and the like. Uh, so uh, this region is lifting its economic performance at twice the global average and is seen as the key to fighting poverty and increasing people's welfare. Now, there are some weak aspects to how this development process is happening. One of those is water governance and what uh, um, John Dore here calls deliberative water <coughs> governance. And this is a quote um, by John as to the aspiration um, that he would like to see and is currently not happening. And that's ideally decisions will be the result of an informed and negotiated process that has assessed options and impacts, respected rights, accounted for risks, acknowledged responsibilities, and sought to fairly distribute the rewards. That's the essence of deliberative water management. So if we look at the, uh, the scorecard on the Mekong, it's a, it's a much weaker profile. And I should say the Mekong River Commission was the winner of the Teese Prize in 2002. But that just deals with the lower four countries. Um, here we're looking at the whole basin. And um, you can see uh, an, uh, a number of lower scores here. And I've signed the lowest score for participation of all stakeholders in planning, decision making, and actions. And currently, those decisions are being made um, uh, politically and financially rather than through uh, stakeholder involvement. So there's a few uh, comments on the future of IRBM, um, and you're all well aware of these, and it's been covered by a number of authors. Water scarcity, so water shortage is now occurring in a third of the planet's basins and aquifers, affecting half the world's population and three quarters of irrigated areas. And even small incidents, relatively small incidents of uh, water shortage can create enormous economic impacts. Here's a $12 billion loss in one state uh, in one year. Large water infrastructure um, is going gangbusters. And um, here's an example from India who are planning I think to build 260 dams and a massive scheme of interbasin transfers. And you're already familiar from other talks with the rapid growth in hydropower development. So one of the outcomes of this 
um, huge investment in water infrastructure is two forms of impact, one on river connectivity and the other on um, a disruption of the flow regime. And this um, prediction sees those two impacts increasing uh, quite rapidly in the near future. Climate change, of course, um, we're all fully aware of the effects of, of, of floods and droughts. And there are many more other uh, impacts and temperature alone um, has, you know, uh, in parts of Australia, we found temperature alone is the, having the major impact on survival of species. Our species are very sensitive to temperature. So it's one that's sometimes overlooked. And finally, um, putting IRBM in the context of, you know, the wider story of, uh, of where we're at uh, in terms of human influence on the Earth system uh, and our new era of the Anthropocene. Uh, you're probably aware of the planetary boundaries analysis that's come out showing that we have exceeded Earth's capacity in a whole number, well, in these three areas in terms of biodiversity, climate change, and uh, the nitrogen cycle. Um, and what this means is that uh, business as usual is not an option. To me, one of the big risks is the, our lack of understanding of the complex non-linear nature and the embedded thresholds and tipping points in many of our systems that are going to surprise us in the future and take us off our guard um, at all sorts of scales, not only um, you know, on these large parts of the world, but in particular river basins. So we do need a new thinking. Concepts of ecosystem services, natural capital have been around 15 or 20 years now, but um, really struggling to take hold uh, in the uh, sort of economic domain. And uh, there's proposals to change GDP to GPI, the, um, um, the Global Progress Indicator, which is, um, you know, it's a very powerful concept, but the uptake is, is not at all uh, significant at this point in time. However, we are seeing some response from business. So in our, in our economic world, business is the main player. And here we see, for example, at the World Economic Forum recently, water shortages flagged in the top three global risk. And 70% of companies reporting increasing exposure to water risks. Now, the benefits of engaging business is business is good at coming up with solutions. And um, I think we've still got a long way to go to um, really bring about this proper engagement. So my take-home messages are IRBM is, is a fantastic concept. It's well established now. And by and large, it's performing very highly. We have some very good examples of IRBM best practice. Um, there is some emerging understanding of the success criteria, which we need to look at in any application of IRBM. We see from the stories that IRBM can take time and I was fascinated by the water directive's uh, ambitions of uh, 2015 when um, it's taken 30 years and a lot longer to make progress in the Rhine. It is really a, a long-term proposition requiring a lot of persistence and in many occasions a lot of money. Um, sharing of these experiences is increasing. Um, the one area I said and the proposition really that the development of uh, some of the world's best uh, and healthiest river basins that are now under severe pressure um, is not uh, performing well against the IRBM criteria and I think that's a real major challenge. Future pressures are enormous so we're looking at a world of ever increasing population. We add 80 million people to the planet every year net, um, huge investments proposed in rivers for infrastructure and climate change um, marching on very strongly. Um, so there's plenty of work for us uh, looking forward. And 
the point here that IBM is a subset of a, a needed wider change in how we organize ourselves in our socio-ecological uh, system and engaging business is an important part of that solution. Thank you.